Let's do it. Good afternoon, everybody. I will call the meeting of the Environment Committee to order. And as usual, I will read the chair's statement, which is the Metropolitan Council chair has determined it is not practical or prudent to conduct in-person meetings in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, committee members are participating in this meeting via telephone or interactive technology, and we are being uh, conducted under Minnesota statute section 13D.021. We encourage anybody to uh, monitor this meeting remotely, and if you have comments, we encourage members of the public to use this email address, public.info at metc.st. A T E dot M N dot U S. That's public dot info at M E T C dot state dot M N dot U S. And with that being said, uh, unless there's any objection, the agenda is approved. Uh, next item is the approval of the minutes from December 14th, 2020. Chair Lindstrom, excuse yeah. me. Um, we do need to do a roll call. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, let's please go ahead. Not a problem. So I, I just texted with uh, Council Member Fredson. He will be joining us shortly. Um, so we'll do a quick roll call. And I'm watching for him to join us. At this time, uh, Council Member Sterner, are you present? Here. Thank you. Vento? Here. Thank you. Um, Council Member Wolf has not joined us yet. Nope, but I'm, I'm here. I'm here. here. I finally got the right link to get in. I Yay. couldn't find the meeting link, and then I found one, and it put me into the March 8th meeting and asked me to wait in the lobby. <laughs> you were really early. <laughs> you were really early. All right. So you popped in, and I didn't see you join. So thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Zarin? Present. Ann Lindstrom? Here. And I do see that Council Member Fredson has now joined us. I'm here. I'm going to try to log in by computer, too. Thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. And uh, let now that takes us to the approval of the minutes from December 14th. Is there a motion and second on those minutes? I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. Wolf seconds. Roll call. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Thank you. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. And Lindstrom? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And that takes us to our one and only non consent uh, business. We don't have any items on our consent agenda this afternoon, but we do have one non-consent agenda item, which is 2022-12, mechanical pipe fitting services for all of our facilities. Mr. Tierney. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council Committee members. Um, I'm a pretty usual visitor to your to your group here with uh, my my contracts. <laughs> Welcome uh, back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so, yep, I uh, am here to discuss uh, the business item 20 or 2022-12. That's our mechanical pipe fitting services for the Met Metropolitan Council Environment of Services, contract 21P247. Next slide. So typically our piping systems do not require preventive maintenance. The workload is based on emergency failures, scheduled replacements or upgrades to our systems components. Due to varying size of work scopes, contractors have the flexibility to adjust staffing levels dependent on urgency and the volume of work at each location. One example, for instance, when we take our Metro Solids Management Building down for repairs or a steam outage, there's a very narrow window of time to complete the work and get all the processes back up and running optimally. Just because our incineration process is down, we still have 175 million gallons of influent waste coming into our plant daily. 
In most cases, we plan and schedule outages months in advance. We have long-term planning meetings and schedule as much work as possible to take advantage of these outages. We may require 12 to 15 or more pipe fitters to get the required work done. The next day's workload may only require four pipe fitters. Having this contract allows this flexibility. Next slide. Um, required licenses and qualifications. So contractors can supply us with the, the personnel that have the specialized license, expertise, and a proficiency needed for each of the jobs that we, we require to be done. Um, they maintain all the training, the, the certifications, and required qualifications. They supply specialized tools, equipment, and safety training required. This allows us the, the flexibility of having the latest and greatest with our, with our contractors um, so we don't have to either maintain or purchase or, or have this equipment or training or, you know, the other things that are needed. Uh, an ARV stamp, for, for instance, um, the contractors supply all that. Um, next slide. As technology has advanced and, and pipe feeding staff has decreased over the years, work has been reassigned to our electrical and machinist crews. Work that does not require special licenses or meeting codes can be reassigned as best fit. In some cases, this allows us to improve efficiency and cost by sending one technician on a job instead of multiple crafts to do the same work. By redistributing this work to the electrical and mechanical crews and outsourcing the work that requires special licenses, we have improved overall coordination between our trades and reduced inefficiencies in our shop. In many cases, we rely on, con we rely on contractors to source and procure miscellaneous parts that are inexpensive, or if a job requires bulk quantities, they often get a, a far better competitive rate and can have them delivered much quicker than we can procure and have delivered ourselves. This also allows us to reduce inventories in our warehouse locations where it makes sense. Next slide. So the rationale, um, we had invitation for bids advertised on October 18th, 2021. We had a pre-bid meeting hosted by council staff. Um, there were three bids received. The lowest response of responsible bidder was determined to be Corval Constructors. Um, we went through the Office of Equal Opportunity and did not assign a Metropolitan Council underutilized business or MCUB goal to this contract. One, one thing that we did do for this contract is we carved out uh, a lot of our, our uh, plumbing work. So anything that goes to a sanitary sewer, which roughly we figure about $80,000 a year. So we have a contract for about $450,000 for an MCUB. Um, working with Ashante Payne and his group, we, uh, I think I previously mentioned in our HVAC contract meeting that we had, we did a PowerPoint presentation with, uh, uh, mechanical companies that were M Cubs and a lot of these were, were plumbers or they, they did HVAC and plumbing work. So we kind of explained to them what we're looking for in this type of contract so they'll be able to bid on it, know exactly what we need. We know some of their pain points and can work with them in that process. So that was some of the, the ways that we, we met our MCUB goal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the proposed actions at the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute contract 21P247 with Corval Constructors Inc. to provide mechanical pipe fitting services for the Metropolitan Council Environmental Service Facilities in an amount not to exceed $8 million. Next slide. So if there's any questions that you all have. Questions for Mr. Tierney. I may not be able to see you all, so... Uh, oh, there we go. Any questions? Council Member Zierick. Yes, thank you, Chair Lestrom. Of course, going to get a question from me. <laughs> uh, how long is this contract for? $8 million, uh, but I, I'm not seeing the, the term or the duration. Um, I, I'm guessing three years. Uh, so, Mr. Fair. Chair, yep. Mr. Chair and Council Committee, uh, it, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a three-year contract with the option to extend for two 12-month periods. 
So up to five years. Any follow up on that, council member? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that's what we're going for on on a lot of these like uh, trade uh, contracts is three years. Can you give uh, us a rationale why that's smart to do? Uh, I, I think I know the answer, but I'm I'm teeing one up for you here, John. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, so that three year period, we the initial three years is we have uh, the the way we do the bidding is they add up, you know, what they believe wages are going to be, the percent markup, any rental equipment, anything like that, and then they give us that bid. From there, you know, we can we can request to extend that contract. But they're going to give us our, you know, their terms, and if we don't accept those at that point, we can, you know, not accept and 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 go out for bid for another contract or, you know, whatever those next steps might be. Uh, did I answer your question right? Council members here. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that that answers my question. I, I think it's. The flexibility is what we're looking for, right? Is Absolutely. You know, be able right. to get the manpower, the person power that we need to arrive when we need them, do the task, get the plant back online in a timely manner. And and we're pulling from a group of folks that are that are pre pre qualified and it that that makes a lot of sense to me. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's our that's our biggest thing, especially with shutdowns, things like that. Like I say, we can require up to 15 fitters and more in some cases, and then still have other projects at other plants. So, and then we, we got a, a base amount of folks that we have on staff all the time. And a little something we're doing different this time, this contract is we're allowing third, fourth, and fifth year apprentices. So we're, we're also, that was another initiative to kind of meet an MCUB goal. If, uh, if we had apprentices, you know, um, not that it would be women or BIPOC necessarily, but at least that would be something that we can have in conversations when we, once we it's awarded, we're going to have those conversations about what type of apprentices that they can, that they can supply. Great. Uh, council member, oh, Zirin, council member Zirin, do you have a, a follow up on that? Is Go that, ahead. Is that, if that's OK, I, I don't mean Please. to monopolize it, but I, ju I just want to re reiterate one one point here that MCUB is for unutilized businesses. Uh, what we're talking about when it comes to uh, apprenticeship, that's workforce development. Those Absolutely. Are, you know, two different things in the workforce development, we can we can in certainly insist that uh that we're bringing uh folks that look like our our uh traditional neighborhoods in, into that um into the apprenticeship and make sure we're supporting uh you know bipoc folks uh in the trades and uh, at some time maybe they want to open their own shop and uh and have the ability to bid on on uh some of these services and uh, so by saying uh you know the question the follow-up question then for me would be is if Corval uh, uh, participates in apprenticeship programs and it it sounds like they do they do yep and I might have misspoke I, I didn't necessarily mean on you know M cub as a business I meant was a kind of an initiative to somehow meet some sure. of those goals to you know the demographics of our area have have those folks you know assist or open doors for them in our in our our type of work we're totally about that <laughs> indeed uh, council member sterner thank you chair lindstrom I, uh my question uh to you, mr tierney was is was there an engineer's estimate on what we expected the cost to be uh when we get when we went out for bids um are you are you talking about what the bids came in at well, what the bids came in at and what we expected the bids to come in at. Yeah, actually, we were. We were pretty close. Um, figured that, that 5 to $6 million for the first three years. Yeah, we're pretty close on that. That's kind of the ballpark that we were thinking. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. 
Great. If there's no other questions, then we can move forward with a motion. Wolf moves Mr. approval. President. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Hudson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. And Lindstrom? Aye. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thanks all for your time. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. You're welcome back anytime. <laughs> okay, we'll see ya. I will see you next back. time. You're not too far away. I got another contract coming up. So. Hey, that sounds we'll, good. We will be ready. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you all. Thank you. Uh, up next, uh, we have some new numbers in terms of local and national competitiveness from Mr. Schuler. Thank you, Chair Lindstrom and council members. I'm Dan Schuler. I've worked in ES finance for 22 years now. And I'm here today to talk about residential sewer rates and to show how they differ within our region's 110 communities. And then also show how our regional average rate compares to other large regions and large cities nationwide. Next slide. So today I will go through two surveys. The first one, a lot of you are probably familiar with. We do this every two years and we do it internally and we basically get the retail sewer rate from each of our 110 communities so we can compare them to each other each other cities and then we average we do a weighted average of all of those 110 to get a number that we compare to the national um, information that we get from NACWA, the national association of clean water agencies they do a triennial survey every three years. The years don't exactly sync up, but they're usually close enough to compare. And we use that data to compare to other cities, like I said. Next slide. I'll start with our biennial local survey. We've done this survey every year for two years, every two years for over 30 years. And what we do is ask each city or get it from their website, what their retail sewer rate for a household is that uses 15,000 gallons of water each quarter so that it's consistent from, you know, survey to survey and city to city. And one thing to keep in mind through this, this whole um, talk today is that we as a wholesaler charge the cities a set rate and then they each mark it up differently. The cities have their own costs to recover because they have their local pipes and lift stations. And so each city marks it up different. And so each city has different rates. And that's why we kind of look at all of them to compare. In as an example, this in the 2020 survey, you can see on that third bullet, we, we charge an average of $188 per household per year to the cities and the total average of all of the retail rates of the cities is $347. So our, <clears throat> our amount is about 54% of what total households pay. Next slide, please. Here you can see 
how much city charges vary. Um, you can, the top bullet, our average, the weighted average is $347, but the 10 highest charges for the 10 high, the cities with the 10 highest range from $556 to the, the highest city was $924. And the 10 lowest are $150 to $231 range. And we have um, a table at the back of the, we have a report that we put out every two years and it's on our website. And you can see this, the link there if you wanna um, look at what any of the cities are or what, how, what type of um, logic they use to calculate their rates. At the bottom, the bottom bullet on the slide, I show the, by population, the five biggest cities in our region and what their average household rate is. The, the largest cities tend to be kind of near the average. And then some of the smaller cities tend to have either high rates or low rates is what we've noticed in the past. Next slide, please. This is a, this graph shows the region's average retail charge for the past 34 years. You can see that we've tracked pretty close to inflation until about 10 years ago when we, our, our regional rate sort of increased in the last 10 years, it's averaged about a 5% increase each year <clears throat> and if if you had a national average it's amazing how we actually track really close to the trend nationwide N nationwide the last 10 years have increased more than inflation also and you can see long-term inflation is average about two and a half percent and our region's rate has increased about close to three and a half percent. Next slide. This is just shows how the cities charge. It's sort of a methodology for the rate formulas. The vast majority of cities, as you can see, have a base uniform rate structure, which is basically a fixed charge plus an additional volume charge. The other rates are kind of self-explanatory. But in the report on the website, it has goes into a lot more detail about a lot of this methodology. Flat charge, of course, there are several cities that just charge a flat amount, say $250 a year to a household, no matter how much water they use. Next slide, please. And talking about flat rates, Flat rates don't encourage using less water. So we like to actually see this percentage drop, which it has, as you can see, which has been nice. And mostly smaller cities use flat rates. I'm not sure why I mean, to, it's easier is, is one big advantage of it. And no water meter metering is needed. And, and as an example of the, um, I don't know if I show, but 17 cities out of our 110 use flat rates. An example is some of the larger of the small cities are Andover, Blaine, Brooklyn Center, Orono, and Shorewood are some examples. Next slide. This um, chart has a lot of information on it, but it basically shows NACWA's um, average, the peer average, the second column, compared to our number in the first column. Um, I, I didn't mention, and what's important is that when we look at NACWA information, there's, they, Every, every three years they get over 100, 100 agencies, 
waste, wastewater agencies that um, complete the survey, but we sort of ignore everyone except the large agencies, which we call our peers. And a peer, we consider them if they treat more than 100 million gallons a day, that compares to our roughly 250 million gal gallons a day. But 100, 100 million gallons a day is roughly equivalent to 1 million people population. Um, this, this table shows five metrics that we look at. The, the survey from NACWA actually is a hundred hundreds of questions and it has a lot of information and we look at we actually look at about 10 different metrics and these are probably the top five with the first row there the average um retail sewer rate is actually the the one we focus most on but this gives you a little more information on, and it shows the rank of, usually there are about 20, some, some questions, some agencies answer and they some don't. That's why it's 20, 22 or 21 and why that's different. But the percentile rank shows how many, the percent of cities that have higher rate than us, for example, on the first row. So you can see we rank pretty close to the middle for most metrics. However, on the next slide, next slide, please. The next slide, you can see the, the retail average rate MCS in the first column and how we compare to the NACWA numbers and it this shows how this recent survey was probably our lowest percentile rank ever but there's a reason for it it was mainly because four peer agencies that have always been on past surveys and had higher rates than us didn't report this time and those were dallas philadelphia milwaukee in Miami and this kind of shows that we want to be careful putting too much confidence in the survey because a lot depends on who reports and when so it's not a it's kind of a good guide but not a, a perfect type thing to put too much weight on next slide please Dan if I could uh, interject for a, a moment one thing that I I hear Ned talk about uh, on uh, uh, presentations is that we're 40% below the average rate for similarly sized systems. So uh, looking at this, we're, we're close to that, maybe uh, not, not quite. Is that, is that accurate to say? About 40% or maybe it's uh, just shy of that? Yeah, Chair Lindstrom, the, the it actually dropped to 35% this year. And uh, it has been 40% for a long time, but now we'll have to update our website and say 35%. It's now, still not too shabby. And it's probably more like 40% if you include those uh, those right. systems that you just mentioned, the Miami and Dallas and the others. Yeah, and this in the next two slides, we'll show just what you're what you're talking about this this slide i only added this is um the last survey from it was a 2017 survey which was of the 2016 data so in 2016 like just what you said were our rate was 274 dollars and the peer average was 468 dollars so we're 40 percent lower than that average. And next slide, please. This shows that same graph with the recent data. 
as you can see, the $347 number I was talking about, and the peer average now is in 2020. Well, the 2020 is the 2020 survey of 2019 data. So the $535 was the peer average. So now just what you were talking about, it's now 35%. Next slide, please. This is this is my last slide, actually, and it shows another metric we look at. Probably our second most important metric we we kind of pay attention to, and it's debt per capita. This is the total outstanding debt per customer population, which for us is about. 2.8 million of the region's total 3.1 million population, because the vast majority, of course, of households are sewered, but some are on septic systems, so that's the difference. And we look pretty good in this measure. However, one thing you have to keep in mind is kind of apples and oranges comparison for this, because some cities, the lower numbers, some cities actually use property taxes or ad valorem taxes, they're called, to pay some of their capital costs. For example, LA, Los Angeles, the lowest number, they do that. And Chicago also gets a chunk of money from ad valorem taxes. And some cities like Denver, they, they actually pay most of their, or maybe even all of their capital expense pay as you go, or effectively they pay cash for, so, it, you know, they're, the debt, they don't have any debt, so, or not much. And and then, the, and then the, on the other end of the spectrum, the some of these really high numbers, a lot of those cities have PCA consent decrees to separate stormwater sewers and, and wastewater sewers, so, we luckily have avoided that. That's one great thing about our system that we've really done a good job in the distant past, keeping that kind of cost from hitting our system. So next slide. This is a lot of information, but I'd be happy to try and answer any questions if you have any. <laughs> Great presentation. Any questions? Questions out there? This is a great service by NACWA to provide this survey. And like you said, it's a very detailed survey and I'm Sure, we get good information from it, and um, we use it all the time to say that forty percent number or now thirty five percent number, which, like I said, is pretty pretty darn good. So, um, yeah, so well, glad we have this information. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we'll update. There's some older numbers on our website still, and we'll try and up the, update those soon. And then, if you want to look at the report to look at if you're interested in all the city by city rates and their methodology of sizes. That's to see that the number going, to that uh, number of cities that are billing on a flat rate. Um, I recall when, when, uh, when my city uh, made that switch and it was probably around 2006, 2007 or so when a lot of other cities were doing the exact same thing mm -hmm. to encourage water conservation. Yeah, and so it's hopefully we'll see that number of five percent go down to four, three, two, one. Yeah, I wonder. Um, it might. I have a feeling that it's going to stick at some point. <laughs> yeah, but sure. Very good. Well, thanks again. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. All right, and that takes us to our next information item, which is uh, 
a grant program, water efficiency grant program. Welcome back, Brian Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and council members. I'm uh, happy to be here and happy to have some information for you about our water efficiency grant program, the upcoming version uh, to commence on July 1st of this year. Next slide. So we've been fortunate to have received funding uh, through the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment and the Minnesota Legislature uh, for two versions of this program thus far, one of which is ongoing right now. So we received funding uh, from the 2015 and 2019 legislatures and also the uh, 2021 most recently. And we have used this funding to do replacements of EPA water sense labeled devices such as toilets and weather based irrigation controllers like you see in the images there and also clothes washing machines that are certified by the Department of Energy Energy, Energy Star program. Next slide. And we've had a lot of success with this program. It's been very popular. Uh, we've had over 7,000 total devices that we have helped fund the replacement of since we began the program. And you can see on the graph here that these numbers uh, comprise over 1,000 clothes washers, over 2,000 irrigation controllers, and over 3,000 toilets, as well as a small number of irrigation audits that have been conducted. So a large number of devices. Next slide. And when you add up the dollars that have been rebated through the program uh, from the Metropolitan Council through the funds that we've received, it's over $1.1 million since the beginning of the program back in 2015. And you can see the breakdown uh, here in dollars by component. The different colors correspond to the different versions of the program. The first program is the blue, 2015 to 2017, and the orange is the most recent and uh, ongoing program, which runs through June 30th of this year. Um, so you can see the relative breakdown in dollars here um, and what we have refunded largest number for irrigation controllers, which have been a very popular item in the program. Next slide. And when you break it down by gallon save per year by device under the program, uh, it is two versions. We end up with over 107 million gallons per year saved each year as of uh, the most recent uh, round of numbers that I've received. So you can see here the breakdown by device in total gallons saved per year. So um, we're at over 40 million gallons per year with irrigation controllers and a similar amount uh, with toilets. Irrigation audits, a small number, but there's a large number of gallons saved because we've had some large commercial properties that have been audited in that, in that part of the program uh, that have a lot of savings available. Closed washers, uh, a smaller amount of savings uh, because they just use less water per year uh, given the typical use, but they're also a very popular item because just about everybody has a clothes washer and they don't last forever. Next slide. So we're fortunate to have been awarded our first award from EPA Water Sense uh, last year. Uh, we received the Excellence in Strategic Collaboration Award, uh, which was an exciting thing for us. Uh, we, we have not received any award like this before for our program, so we are very pleased to, to be uh, um, honored in this way by EPA Water Sense uh, for our work thus far. Next slide. So one thing that we've been thinking about uh, lately, uh, after we received uh, the most recent round of funding in uh, summer of 2021, is how can we improve this program? I mean, I, I'm the one who interfaces with the 38 participating communities in the program. Um, so I know these people pretty well. Uh, and I thought, well, they're the people who we should be talking to, to see what it is that we can do better, what we can add, what we can subtract from this program as we move into the next version of it. So I created a survey last summer using SurveyMonkey, tried to make it uh, a easy survey, one that people would be most likely to complete, that want to make it too long or too complicated. But yet I wanted to get good information. So it's kind of a needle threading exercise when you do that. 
I had seven questions and I sent it to 52 people uh, from 38 participating communities. Sometimes there's more than one person that I deal with at, at these communities, sometimes it's three. And we actually had a, a pretty amazing response rate, 61.5%, uh, which is darn good for a survey. So, you know, yay for us in the survey. Um, that was good. So I just wanted to show you some of the things that we heard from people about the, about uh, what they'd like to see in the new program and what they don't like about this program. Next slide, please. So uh, the first question that I asked was related to community challenges to their water efficiency grant programs. And of course, with the pandemic, which we're going on to nearly year two of that now, uh, that's obviously and not surprisingly, been the biggest factor uh, that has been that has impeded uh, the rate of spend that these communities have achieved in the program. Um, I think we're a little bit behind uh, as compared to where we wanted to be in terms of how much money that we've spent. But of course, you know, the year 2020 was was quite a year, and it took a while for these communities to to ramp up their programs longer than usual. Uh, not surprisingly, and so. It's been a little bit slow for them, um, staying at home, working from home, staffing concerns. And you can see the other issues that we have listed here um, on the on this chart, which came from the survey. So the pandemic related factors, marketing issues. Uh, of course, I think this is always something that, that they and we have to deal with um, in this program. It's getting the word out about it. It's something that they and we try to do, but you know, we're not marketing people and people have limited time to do this especially in in cities uh you know they don't necessarily have somebody on staff who can 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 just do this as a full-time or even half-time thing so uh that's definitely an issue staffing shortages uh, that's something that's come up especially recently uh in cities um impeding their ability to process receipts and things like that um also the, the rebate doesn't include all the items that they would like it to of the EPA water sense and DOE Energy Star related items. So that was something that we that we uh, have been talking about. And also the rebate is too small on a bigger rebate. Next slide. So we asked, well, what items should be included in the next water efficiency grant program? And so we listed items that we currently uh, provide refunds for. And then I went out and did some searching and went and found some other ones that have EPA water sense specifications or DOE energy SNAR specifications and put them on a list and ask people, well, what would you like to see? And uh, fortunately uh, for us, a number of these items, most of them are ones that we already do rebate for. The weather-based irrigation controllers, toilets are the top two. Um, but number three is, is a new one, one that we haven't rebated for before, but it does have a, a uh, specification with EPA and that is our, or with, with DOE in this case, and that is residential dishwashers. So that's something that we took note of. Um, next to our clothes washers and irrigation system audits, uh, and then irrigation spray sprinkler bodies. And those are all ones that we currently have in the program. So this was, um, you know, it was heartening to see that we've included most of the things that people say that they would like to have in the program, but the residential dishwashers was a new one for us. Next slide. So we asked, how should the program be changed for the next round? Um, and the most popular response, as you see in green there, is include additional items in the program. And that was primarily uh, residential dishwashers. Those are something that, that the communities really want to see added. So um, that is something that, that we're going to add in the program in the next round. Also, Cities uh, wanted a smaller city match and a larger Met Council contribution. Those are two sides of the same coin there in blue and yellow. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the light blue is smaller or no match from the residents. So right now we require that each uh, property owner or resident who is, is purchasing a device for replacement has to contribute some proportion of the cost. And, you know, what proportion that is, is for the cities to decide individually. Um, but that is something um, that, that we heard. So smaller or no match from residents. And also uh, there's a, a smaller proportion of people who said easier reporting. Um, and of course that's my 
my bailiwick, right? Because I'm the one who handles the reporting. Next slide. And we wanted to know if they were happy with the program and, and, and obviously one way to, to see if they're happy with the program is to see if they're planning on applying for the next program, 22 to 2024. And we were very pleased to see that just about everybody, not quite, but just about everybody who responded to the survey and answered this question, which was, I believe most of the respondents said, yes, we're gonna apply for it. So that's good, good sign. Next slide. And we asked them, has your program been successful? You know, how one, I, I didn't give them a, a definition of successful, my definition of successful. And I guess that's what a word like many that you could find many definitions, depending on who you ask and when you ask them. Um, but we did see in the survey that about two thirds of the respondents said that their program had been very successful um, and that another nearly one third said somewhat successful. Only a, there was only one respondent who said that it had been neither successful nor unsuccessful, and nobody said unsuccessful. So that's you know that's good to hear. You know we could do better, but we're not doing terribly. So that's nice. Next slide. So we are going to do some community source changes to the program uh, coming up in uh, this next round. We are going to add dishwashers. And we're also gonna add a new one that wasn't mentioned by um, the respondents because we didn't ask a question about it, but it is a new thing which is now available as a standard under EPA WaterSense, and that is a soil moisture-based irrigation controller. So um, in addition to the weather-based controllers, which use forecasts, previous weather, future weather, current conditions to make changes to the irrigation schedule, um, there's now finally uh, a EPA water sense standard on soil moisture based irrigation controllers that actually use a, a sensor in the soil that's measuring the moisture content uh, to make um, changes to the irrigation program. So it's basically like, you know, as an analogy, like the, you know, the gas gauge on your car, you know, how much so how much water is in the soil. It's something that you can't see, but it's the most important thing when it comes to um, plant growth in terms of water. We're also going to increase uh, the Met Council proportion of the uh, of the rebate to 90% and decrease the city match to 10%. It's currently at 75%, 25%. So we're going to change it to 90 to 10. Um, and you know that's in part because it's something that cities want. And I know that you know cities are you know they're under a lot of stress right now <laughs> with the with the pandemic and staffing and things like that. And they're trying to spend the money as fast as they can. It's been a challenge. We're going to try to make it easier um, for the cities themselves so they don't have to put quite as much money up as a match this time around. And we're also going to eliminate the requirement of the homeowner contribution this time. Uh, that is, a you know, the, the amount, as I've said, varies from place to place, depending on what cities, uh, you know, want to require. Um, we're going to eliminate that as a requirement. Um, cities can still do it if they want. We're not saying they can't do it we are saying that they don't have to do it. So if a city chooses to not have a homeowner contribution, that is something that could increase um, the equity of the program because certainly there are people in, in all cities who would have a hard time coming up with, you know, money for a clothes washer and things like that. So we're gonna, that's just a new option that I think is important. So next slide. So we have a million dollars available uh, starting July 1 of this year, running through June 30 of 2024, so two years. And these funds will be available through the grant program to municipalities that are served by a water supply system, a municipal water supply system. We're gonna have a maximum grant amount of 50,000 and a minimum of five. Uh, we're gonna do the 90% council, 10% municipality split. Um, you don't have to be a math major to see that 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 image below is has the old numbers on it, 75, 25. Um, so let's just, you know, make lemonade out of lemons here and, and say that in the new program, the top two numbers are gonna change to 18,000 and 2,000. So we have a 90, 10 split instead of the 75, 25 currently. So it'll be more advantageous to the communities, um, but in the end, it's the same amount of money being spent. Uh, next slide, please. So the timeline for the program uh, today, I'm presenting to you as an information item. Uh, we plan to announce the program next week and uh, make the application available 
to communities. We're going to have a, an application deadline of March 4th, so they have time to think about it, get people together, decide on it. Uh, we're going to try to turn around the applications quickly and make decisions by the end of March, as we've done in the past. Uh, we, we're, we have a good system, I think, for that, um, and we'll use it again. And then we'll come back to you at the Environment Committee in mid-April and then to the full council at the end of April to uh, ask for approval of the decision and the awards to communities and then grant them at the end of April. Uh, it usually takes communities, in my experience, about two months or so to actually get approval um, and, and signatures on the grant, grant uh, legal agreements for the program. Um, sometimes there's city manager signatures, sometimes it's city councils that have to approve it. So it takes some time, um, but we should be able to get it done in two months, maybe three at the most. So communities can, can get started with their program on July 1st. Um, so for some communities that already are in the existing program, it may be a somewhat seamless transition into the new one. Um, and hopefully we'll get some new communities that are not currently participating uh, to uh, start up on July 1. So that is our timeline. And uh, next slide, please. So I'd be happy to take any questions from uh, the council members about the program. Outstanding. Uh, council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions or, or well, a question and maybe a comment. So you've talked about having no uh, homeowner contribution required. Are you saying that the program could buy them a brand new clothes washer and they don't have to pay anything? I'm, that, that seems a little excessive. Uh, I guess, uh, um, Mr. Chair and Council Member Wolf, yes, that would be definitely excessive um, <laughs> because they're expensive. My gosh. I mean, I've, I've, I've looked them up recently and it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm glad our, our old one still works. Um, I would, yeah, I would be uh, shocked if any community would go ahead and, and go do something like that because they would spend through their money so quickly um, and they get very little bang for the buck. Um, but I guess technically, yes, that would be an option that a community could pursue if they wanted. Um, I highly doubt that they will, but maybe that's something we should think about. What, what do you think? Well, it, it, that seems to me like a really bad thing to just leave out there. Um, I, to me, I guess I would say we should set a maximum amount for, you know, what's the maximum grant a homeowner could get for a clothes washer? What's the maximum grant they could get for a toilet? What's the maximum grant they could get for a, a dishwasher? Um, I don't think those controllers cost very much. They're only like 150 bucks or something, aren't they? So that's, I don't, you know, right. that's not as big of a deal, but, you know, I don't want to, in terms of equity, that's about as inequitable as you could get because if you live in the cities that participate, they uh, th they could buy their residents free washers where if you are in a community that for whatever reason wasn't able to participate, you're paying 100% of your washer. So, I mean, if we're gonna have equity, having some sort of maximum in there, I think is is a better way to to do it. There, You shouldn't get a free washer or dishwasher or toilet out of the program is, I mean, that makes sense to me anyway. Um, and then my other comment, I guess, is what are we doing to recruit more cities to participate? Yeah, but thank you, uh, um, Councilmember Wolf, for that question. What are we doing to encourage more communities to participate? Um, in water supply planning, uh, what we're do what we've been doing over the past couple of years is doing subregional water supply work group meetings in the northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast uh, metros, and talking about this program, presenting on it, giving information like this. Um, that has been a pretty good way for us to get the word out about it. Uh, we're going to be working with our communications group um, to uh, starting tomorrow actually to get newsletter articles out about this. Um, but I think there, there's gotta be some, this is where I always, uh, kind of fall down on it. Cause I'm, I'm not 
much of a marketing person myself, certainly not my area of training as an engineer. And Mr. Chair, I, for me, I mean, I'm willing to talk to the cities. I have not all of them are in our municipal or in our sewer system. So, you know, I've got some some uh, rural center communities that have their own systems. But um, for the communities that are hooked to our system that aren't participating in this, I would be willing to reach out directly to those communities because I think sometimes these things might get lost in the there's just so much information being poured at everybody all the time and perhaps if you know even if the utility folks are not particularly interested the elected officials or the city administrator or somebody might want to you might not have heard of this but might they might want to get involved uh, speaking of which, I was looking on the website today and trying to figure out which communities were participating. And we have some information, but we don't have anything about which cities are participating on the, on the website. I did see that Apple Valley and Farmington in my district by doing a Google search have rebates, but um, it'd be nice to have more information available for people to to understand what's going on. I actually had to buy a new toilet today and I would have liked to get a rebate, but as far as I can tell, looking online, Lakeville doesn't offer that thing right now. But um, I would, like I've said, I'd be willing to help reach out to my cities anyway to, to try to let them know about this opportunity. Because most cities are, are happy to have basically free money to help their, their, uh, constituents improve their their homes good points and uh, uh, I suspect all of us would be willing to do the same uh, reaching out to our own communities in fact and not just us but the council uh, council members as a whole so uh, when you do make that announcement please make sure that it goes to the entire council um, I, I see Councilmember Sterner, you have your hand, but I also see uh, Ali El Hassan has his hand up as well, and I suspect it's related to this uh, topic. So, uh, Ali, do you uh, would you 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 have the floor? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and and just in answer to Councilmember Wolf. Um, question about how the reach out in the last two uh, rounds uh, one of the things I think and Brian and Brian have have been doing a great job in reaching out to communities through the sub-regional groups and also we reach out to all the council members also to ask for help uh, one of the lacks and I think I really appreciate you are bringing this up uh, council member Wolf is elected officials because most of the time we connect with the public work directors the public work and many times the, the the other people in the city are not aware of it and so and sometimes it might need the help of elected officials to encourage the staff of the city to apply for this for this grant um, one of the things we have done in the past and i think uh, i just wanted to mention here we coordinate before we advertise for for all the communities we coordinate a workshop with the help of metro cities we did this in 2015 and we did this in 2019 just before the corona uh, the coronavirus we were have we were hosted in metro cities who have invited all their members to attend these meetings that brian have uh, you know um provided a lot of information about the grant program how you apply and he brought actually some of the previous applicants and, and we did this in 2019 and we had a forum where the applicants share some of their experiences with the people who wants to apply, the new communities who wants to apply. So we tried to reach through some of these unconventional uh, methods to reach out to communities. But I would really appreciate your help from all the environment committee members to reach out to communities in addition to all the council members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, follow up, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Metro Cities does a great job, and they have a lot of members. But not every city in the metro is a member of Metro Cities. So even with that, we sometimes miss some communities. Indeed, Councilmember Sterner, you've been very patient. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, mine. Uh, has to do with, I, you know, kind of similar what Councilmember Wolf was talking about, like, 
you know, what communities are, are doing it and which one we need help to reach out with. And I'm also seeing like uh, moving up from a uh, consumer, the like consumer should have a little bit of skin in the game, but I also think the city should have more skin in the game than 10% as well. I mean, I, you know, it seems like a 75, 25 would be reasonable from uh, Met Council to city so we can get involved with more communities. So if we shake the bushes quite a bit and get a lot more cities involved, a million won't go as far, but if we, we can get uh, maybe the Met Council to do 75% and the cities are doing 25% with more cities involved where we're getting 100 cities involved, it might be you know more we reach more consumers of the program kind of thing. But that was just you know somewhat my thought with it. With it. And I'll, I'll look what communities that I have that are in it or not in it uh, as well to reach out to more participation as well. Brian, if you could get that out to us, the which cities are participating or which parts which have participated, that would be great. Um, I will. And the good thing is we have some flexibility here, right? From the uh, from the state uh, in terms of whether or not uh, cities should contribute more or less or homeowners should contribute more or less. Uh, we can kind of play around with it a little bit and see how it goes and adjust as needed, like like you are suggesting for this time around. Uh, Council Member Vento. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to suggest that it might help to have some, some background and basic talking points for all of us, especially for the other council members who aren't part of this conversation tonight, so that folks feel comfortable when they reach out. Good point. This is one of my favorite topics because it, in the grand scheme of things, it's a tiny amount of money from the, when you think about the state spending or even our spending tiny amount, but I think it really, really has a big impact out there and, uh, and can t touch a lot of people. Um, so great presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members, and thank you very much for your comments. I, I hear them all, and uh, we will talk about them this week, and we'll make some, some changes. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And last but not least, Lisa, General Manager's Report. Happy hello. New hello. Happy New Year. Um, I don't have anything extra tonight. We're just rowing along and and dealing with a pandemic, much higher incidence of employees calling out or going to get tested. And of course, testing is a frustration for everyone all around. So we're grateful that uh, staff are really trying their best to keep from getting sick. And, and you know, we're pleased because we don't want them to be sick, but it's a little bit challenging right now with the uh, contagiousness of Omicron. We are um, excited on one hand about Omicron because it's putting our testing, our wastewater testing through the hoops in a good way. And so I think there will be things that we'll gain out of this in terms of learning that hopefully if we ever face this again in the future, we might be able to help in some way with the knowledge that we're gathering. And then that concludes what I what I wanted to offer tonight. Uh, last piece, I think you saw the or the uh, report from NACWA today. The fact that our peer group shrunk is a you know is a pretty big factor in terms of our, where we stand now as a percentage. But um, I think it's still one of the better uh, benchmarks. It's really hard to benchmark wastewater because every plant's a little bit different. So you don't have the ability to really stack yourself up against the, the competition. But this is one way that I think gives us a pretty good indicator of whether we're maintaining a good um, handle on our costs and our performance. So really grateful that NACWA is providing this service. I was gonna ask you about the, about the pandemic uh, and the continuity of service um, you, you have really seen, a an increase in the number of employees that are testing positive that are calling in sick. So when we have somebody that has, um, symptoms, then, uh, we send an alert out 
via text or whatever employees have indicated, but mine comes as a text that indicates an employee at a facility um, went home with COVID related symptoms and whether they were in close contact with anybody. Most of the time it says that they weren't in close contact with anyone. Sometimes it'll be a couple people um, and we don't name names, of course, but then the people working at that facility know that they will be contacted if they were one of those close contacts. We had, uh, well, the highest count that I recall, we had 13 in the seven day period. Um, so I haven't, that would have been through last Friday, I believe. So we were really saw an uptick. It hasn't been as many this week. So hopefully as um, I think the press has been reporting that there's some slowing down of the incline and and that's what we're experiencing, but it's still something we need to be vigilant about. Glad we have Absolutely. our incident command. Our folks are pretty, pretty good at that because we've been doing it for a while. And so the communication channels, the, um, the tools and the strategies that we're using are all pretty well understood at this point. Very good. Any questions for Lisa? Councilmember Wolf, you had a public hearing maybe a week ago or less for the Hastings plant. Uh, I did. Go? It went well. Um, many of the people that attended were the same people who attended the open house. Um, and it's brought up some people that we need to communicate a little bit better with and, and, you know, make sure that they know what's going on without having to come to an official public hearing to, to talk about stuff. But uh, staff's been working hard to close those gaps and, and get everybody the, the information that they need. Fantastic. Unless there's anything else, that's a wrap. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks, everyone. You too, Mr. Chair. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.